So, back by zero demand is another video all about something we'll need to know for our GCSE exam. And this one's gonna be about Durham Cathedral. Now Durham Cathedral is gonna be the, the topic of a 16 mark question at the end of our unit on the Normans. 16 mark question, that's like 10% of our whole course. So we need to know quite a lot about Durham Cathedral. So that's what this video is all about. We're gonna look at its uses, um, its strategic uses, its administrative uses, and particularly its religious uses. And we're also gonna look at the building itself and what we can learn about the building and how it's used by the Normans as a way of controlling the local population. Let's begin. Right, so let's talk about why Durham Cathedral is important for religious reasons. Seems to make sense. And it's all to do with this chap here called St. Cuthbert. Here's a picture of him bragging about a book he's just bought. Now, he was made a saint after his death and his body was kept in Linda's farm where he lived most of his life. Now, as you know from our migration topic, Linda's farm is targeted by Vikings raiding for monistic gold. And so they decide, amongst their side, we have to move his body. And so eventually, in 995, his body ends up at Durham. Now to begin with, they think, right, we need to build a shrine for this guy. So, being 995, what do you build a shrine out of? Some wood. So we get a small little wooden building created around the relics of St. Cuthbert. But as time goes on and into the 10 hundreds, we see that replaced by a stone structure called the White Church. And this is quite a big deal in the North because once someone becomes a saint, often we get a little cult that kind of develops around that person. And that is true of St. Cuthbert in the North of England. People hear about St. Cuthbert and they want to go on pilgrimage to where he remains. And one of the most famous pilgrims is King Canute himself, who makes the journey to the White Church, sees um, St. Cuthbert's remains and decides, yes, I like this so much, I'm gonna give Durham extra land because darn it, someone should look after these remains. And then the Normans rock up. Now, in 1080, the King of England, William the Conqueror, appoints another William to be the Bishop of Durham. Now, I don't have a picture of him, but I imagine he probably looks a bit like this. Now, William of Calais was originally a monk from Normandy, so we've got a pretty pious guy running Durham, which is probably a good thing. Now, he looks at what's going on in Durham and in the cathedral, and he doesn't like what he sees. First of all, he doesn't like the fact that priests can marry. He thought, oh, that's not what they should be doing. They should be focused on God. Right, let's get rid of them. So what do you do without priests? You bring in monks. And he looks around and sees there's plenty of monks, particularly north of Durham, which he can round up and bring to Durham Cathedral, which he does. Now, William of Calais is a big fan of Lanfranc's reforms. And Lanfranc didn't like the fact that a lot of monks weren't really following the, um, the vows that they'd made, things like poverty and chastity and giving to charity. So he says, right, I'm gonna make sure that my monks are very strict Benedictine monks. That way, Durham will be like a beacon to the rest of England about this is how it's done properly. So in terms of religion, Durham is actually very important. So let's summarize why Durham Cathedral is really important for spiritual reasons. It's the home of St. Cuthbert and his remains, uh, which means that it's a particularly important place for pilgrimages. And so we get people coming from all over the north of England to go to the site where St. Cuthbert's relics slash remains lie. Lastly, it's a house of important Benedictine monks. It shows that the reforms that Lanfranc is introducing in London is spreading elsewhere, and William of Calais, who remember, becomes the Bishop of Durham in 1080, wants to follow those reforms very closely. And so he makes sure that his Benedictine monks obey the rules of the Benedictine order very, very strictly, just like the Frat Lanfranc wants. So as a building, as you'd expect, Durham Cathedral is, has a very important religious role. Right, let's consider the role of Durham Cathedral as a strategic building. To do this, we need to look at the location. Now, what, apparently, according to legend, when the monks were moving the remains of St. Cuthbert, they were walking around the north of England, and once they got to the site of Durham Cathedral, they could just not pull those remains in the coffin any further. For some reason, it was just like you're stuck. And say they took that as a sign from God that this is the place where the shrine must be built. Now, given that God probably has a bird's eye view of everything, he can probably see why that's a really good spot. Let's have a look at a photo. Now you can see from this photo that the river bends brilliantly um, around this site. And so actually it's a very defensive location. 
Now, given that the, they were moving the remains of St. Cuthbert because of Viking raids, you can understand why those monks might be quite keen to have a very defensive location for their new shrine. And that's why they choose that spot there. Or, God, make them choose that spot there, whichever theory you want to believe. Now, if you zoom out even further, you'll see where Durham lies in England, up there in the north. Now, strategically speaking, you'll remember that that's a really important spot because there's a lot of rebellions in the north of England. It seems like the North people just aren't that big a fan about having a foreigner running the country. It's a good job the North don't have problems with foreigners anymore. <clears throat> Actually, when William is conducting his harrowing of the North in 1069 to 1070, he uses Durham as the centre for his troops and his um, his parties. So actually Durham is very important for him uh, when launching the harrowing of the north. If you zoom even further out you'll notice that Durham is not actually all that far away from Scotland and the Scottish King Malcolm III has got a bit of a habit of helping people who are opposed to the English King. You remember he supported Edgar the Aetheling immediately after William the Conqueror becomes King of England. So that we need a strong person running the Durham area to make sure that any threats from Scotland are dealt with. Fortunately for William, he's come up with a great idea. I'm going to give the people who run Durham more power to make sure any threats from Scotland are dealt with. So what we find is the Bishop of Durham gets a special title and it's called the Prince Bishop. Now the, it's called a Prince Bishop because essentially the Bishop of Durham is going to have powers similar to a monarch or a prince at least. And that means that he's going to have a lot of power and a lot of control over his local area. Now Durham is the only uh, bishopric in the country that has a prince bishop. No other part of the country has one. And the reason why is because the north of England is just such an important location for William. We've got the local people who, as we've seen in the Harrowing of the North, rebelled wildly against the king and we also have the threat of Scotland. So whoever is the bishop of um, Durham is going to have a lot more power than bishops elsewhere. So what this means is, is that when William of Calais becomes the bishop of Durham in 1080, he has the power to create his own parliament, raise his own army, mint his own coins, create his own laws and raise his own taxes. So all this tells us that Durham is strategically exceptionally important. The guy who is in charge, the Bishop of Durham, has all these rights and responsibilities because he needs to be able to respond to threats really, really quickly. Right, next up, the sexy topic of administration. So, what we should know is that Durham plays a very important administrative role in the local area. Now, this is kind of in line with what Lanfranc wanted. Now, we all remember Lanfranc, he's that uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, who decides uh, when he comes to England in 1070. Um, when he comes to England, he says, right, I want to create reforms. I want to change a lot of stuff that's going on in England because actually England is behind the times. One of the key things he does is goes, right, first of all, we need to have uh, cathedrals in highly populated areas. And the example we give in lessons is the one, um, the cathedral from Crediton in Devon is moved to, the uh, to Exeter. That's really important because no one lives in Crediton, people live in Exeter. So if you want to have the cathedral being the centre point around the, of the community, it needs to be in a highly populated area. Durham has had a big town grow up around it, so it's not that the cathedral needs to be moved in Durham, but it does serve an important administrative role for the town around it. So important uh, decisions are made in the cathedral, there's big rooms to allow many people to come in and listen to those decisions, and. Um, the, um, cases can be heard in there as well. Um, Lanfranc is therefore very important, um, uh, very eager to see cathedrals in highly populated areas. Secondly, he also is quite keen to see uh, bishoprics that are, or dioceses really, that are too large cut down a little bit more. Now, if you remember, a diocese is an area which is the responsibility of a clergyman, so someone from the church. In Durham, that's a large area, and so what he says is, right, I'm going to allow Carlisle to have his own diocese because Durham, you need to focus on other issues, local issues, and obviously defending the area. So Durham loses a little bit of Carlisle to create a new diocese. Durham's not the only place where that happens. Lincoln is also a massive diocese, and what they do is they cut off a chunk of that and say, right, Ely is going to have its own cathedral, Ely Cathedral, and you can be responsible for that area. So that's all part of Lanfranc's reforms. 
So Durham Cathedral has an administrative, strategic and a religious role to serve. Right, the next thing we're going to look at is the design of the cathedral and it's all brand new. It's called Romanesque. So why Romanesque? To find that out, we need to go back in time to 1067 and that is when the cathedral in Canterbury gets burnt down. So when Lanfranc becomes the Archbishop in 1070, he needs to rebuild it. And like a lot of Lanfranc's ideas, his rebuilding ideas come from Europe. And so he goes, right, I like the idea of using the architectural styles of Europe, which are really popular in Europe, and bring them to England, where actually the style is really old fashioned. And so he brings across this Romanesque idea of how to build a cathedral. Because the Archbishop of Canterbury is doing it, all the other bishops in the country seem to be looking at him going, wow, that's really, really a cool idea. I should probably convert my cathedral to look just like that. It's what the quite famous historian Mark Morris describes as an architectural revolution, as bishops all over the country start to copy the style that's been used by Lanfranc in Canterbury, called Romanesque. In fact, by the early 1100s, all the cathedrals in England have been knocked down and rebuilt in a Romanesque fashion, all apart from the Westminster Abbey, which was built by King Edward the Confessor, which kind of had Romanesque ideas already because King Edward the Confessor was a big fan of the Normans. So what does this style look like? Well, let me go to a PC and I'll show you. Right, to show some examples of Romanesque architecture in Britain, I've gone to a uh, tower from Bury St Edmunds first of all, because there's a few design ideas in this which are very Romanesque and it's nicely summarized in one picture. So first of all, one of the key features of Romanesque uh, architecture is big rounded arches. And we can see that really clearly here. Um, not just in the archway itself, but in the windows as well. And we'll see a few rounded arched windows in our little presentation. We've also got these weirdly interlocking arches um, on the sides of this building. We'll see a great example of that in Durham, but can you see the way the top of the arches kind of weave uh, in and out of each other? That's another feature of Romanesque architecture. We also got this geometric patterns. Now, they are all over the place in Romanesque buildings and we'll see a lot of those as we go forward. So one other thing that we tend to see in Romanesque architecture which we can't see in this image is the big circular chunky pillars and we're going to see a lot of those. So here's a picture of Durham Cathedral, um, one of the parts of Durham Cathedral at least and sure enough we can see these big rounded arches, there's loads of them in this picture and you, hopefully you've already spotted the geometric patterns that are running along the top of these arches. So classic Romanesque. Another picture from Durham Cathedral, I think this is on the outside of the building, and very clearly we can see then these interlocking arches that we saw in the Bury St Edmunds Tower, classic Romanesque. And sure enough, there we go, geometric pattern there as well. Uh, another picture of Durham Cathedral, um, again, we've got those big rounded arches, we can see some pillars going on there too, um, keeping the roof up. And lastly, here's the main part of Durham Cathedral, and hopefully you can see all those features that we just looked at there we've got those big circular chunky pillars massive things here we've got those rounded arches the pillars are attached to those big rounded arches the pillars themselves have those geometric patterns can you see those zigzaggy lines we'll see those again in the uh, example in a second we've got a lot going on here so this is Durham Cathedral it's very Romanesque give you a, an idea about how popular this Romanesque style was. If you remember, we talked about the fact that lots of people, lots of bishops wanted to copy the designs used by Lanfranc in Canterbury Cathedral. Here's Waltham Abbey. Again, you can see those big pillars and those zigzaggy lines on there um, representing or copying that Romanesque style. We've also got the big arches and the geometric patterns. Here's Peterborough Cathedral, big arches, big um, chunky circular pillars. Um, again, very Romanesque, and we've got the geometric patterns up there too. And here's Hereford Cathedral as well. Again, very Romanesque, big chunky pillars, geometric patterns. Okay, so Romanesque, very popular style in England at the time. So, having just looked at Romanesque architecture, it becomes apparent that there's two really important um, reasons why the Normans used them, other than it's in fashion at the time. First one is it's a great opportunity to show Norman strength. So to the people, the local people in England, here's a way to build up these massive buildings to show, look how powerful we are. We are capable of crafting these incredibly beautiful buildings that function as a way of us to control you. A bit like castles. 
and so it helps keep the local population under control. Secondly, is it implies that there is support from God, that God actually is in favour of the Norman occupation. And remember, everyone in those times are religious, and so if, this, uh, if these buildings are being created to worship God, then that might imply that God supports the Norman occupation. And the last question is how? How on earth are these massive buildings created? Bear in mind we're looking at a time before heavy machinery like cranes and stuff. Well, like the barons, the bishops had access to lots of free labour. Now, because they controlled the land and the people on it, the people on it were expected to give the barons, or the bishops in this case, a certain amount of days per year of free service. So the bishops could use the tenants to work for them for free. Now, these being unskilled tenants, their work's probably going to be things like shifting stone about the place. For the beautiful bits like the carving and the planning of the actual cathedral, you look to foreign labour. So foreign craftsmen, foreign architects who have been building these um, types of buildings in continental Europe would bring brought over to England to help create these new buildings. So, that is pretty much everything we need to know about Durham Cathedral. Make sure you refer to your booklets though because there's still a lot of other stuff that I haven't really mentioned that you can refer to as well. But remember to be thinking about this from the context of the Norman, Norman topic. So, how does Durham Cathedral fit into the topic? And you'll be expected to refer to Durham Cathedral when answering that 16 mark question. Good luck.